Thank you, Miguel. Um, I'll try to keep this short because I know everyone's hungry. Um, my name is Julie Clark. I am a research engineer for Rowan and Donovan. Um, myself and my colleague Rob, Robert Corbelly, we're going to present um, briefly just a, an, an overview of the, the two European case studies that we've looked at in the Inferis project. Um, so I'm just going to start with um, the, the, the aims and the objectives of, of, of why we conducted case studies. Um, and you can see here kind of the, the, the overall structure of the Inferis project in terms of the work packages. Um, so we've already heard from uh, ETH earlier um, in terms of the overarching risk assessment methodology um, that was pre presented by Brian earlier. Um, so that uh, kind of uh, harmonized the, 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 the various work packages um, and that included um, some of the work that we've just heard from Dina and the groups at UCL. Um, and also the, the, the stress tests um, uh, framework that we heard from Peter earlier. Um, so the idea was to, um, to apply these to, to European networks and to, to demonstrate some of the, the, the methodologies and tools that had been developed in the project. Um, so for the case studies, we focused on the um, trans-European TNT network, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and this was considered to be critical uh, European road and rail infrastructure. And um, the objective was to, to perform stress tests um, to, to determine the, the physical damage for networks, the, the travel disruption, and the economic losses um, uh, to assist decision makers in, in, in uh, determining where to, to conduct intervention measures or to pr prioritize uh, resources. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, the, the general process to ensure acceptable levels of risk, um, and this is the um, this is the, uh, the the three steps proposed by ETH: um, initiate the initiated task, uh, then conduct risk assessment, and conduct intervention program. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the the initiate task and the conduct risk assessment task. Um, so. During the project, um, uh, a number of uh, workshops were held, GMA workshops, the General Morphological Analysis, um, and that was hosted by um, uh, Tom Ritchie, one of the consortium partners. Um, and the idea was to, to gather experts and to determine wh what case studies we'd look at and uh, to consider the various hazards and to focus in on uh, network elements and, and what we might look at. Um, so. For the first case study, um, and this was, has already been briefly introduced by Dina, um, we've looked at um, a road network along the uh, Scandinavian Mediterranean corridor of the TANTI network shown there. Um, and you can see uh, the Bologna province is shown on the right-hand side there. And that's the uh, share um, uh, seismic hazard map. So you can see it's located in a, a, an area of high seismicity. Um, we also uh, wanted to look at uh, cascading hazard effects, uh, earthquake triggered landslides. Um, so if you can see here, we, um, we focus on this area because there's a, a moderate uh, susceptibility to landslides as well in this region. Um, and during these workshops, uh, the second case study was also discussed and it was decided what to look at. Um, and we decided to focus upon the um, Mediterranean corridor of the TANTI network shown here, um, and particularly looking at a rail network in, in Croatia um, and looking at the, the potential impacts due to flooding, um, the, and the flood probability is shown there in that image, um, and also uh, rainfall triggered landslides. So I'm going to discuss uh, quickly the the conduct risk assessment tasks that was um, performed for the Italian case study. Um, and to do so, the five steps or tasks defined by ETH were employed. Um, so I'm just going to talk through them quickly. Um, so it was decided, um, based on the, um, the underlying uh, objectives of the project, to look at low probability, high consequence, seismic hazard scenarios for the Italian case study. Um, and also, we, we looked at the cascading um, earthquake-triggered landslide uh, hazard effects. Um, and now, the losses were, were defined in terms of both the, the direct and indirect consequences. So, um, 
in this case, we consider the, the direct consequences to be directly attributable to the um, infrastructure manager, um, but also we, we looked at the indirect consequences, those um, um, in addition to, to direct consequences such as repair costs, um, such as transfer dis disruption um, and the effects, uh, the wider effects of, um, of the uh, network disruption. Um, and for the Italian case study, we performed a numerical exercise. Um, so we performed a quantitative risk assessment to consider the uncertainties and um, to determine the, the distribution of, of losses for various scenarios. So shown here is the, um, the case study region that was examined. Um, and this consists of an area of, of almost 1,000 kilometers squared um, and uh, over 3,000 kilometers of, of roadway. Um, and shown in red there is the, is, that's the main um, motorway in the region the, along the 10T network. And then you can see there's um, various other s smaller roads in that region. Um, and this, as, as mentioned previously, was considered um, a very important um, area in, along the, the Italian road network. Um, Bologna is um, uh, one of the most important business centers in, in Italy, so um, that was one of the reasons for looking at it. Um, so I'll talk quickly through this, as this was briefly, or this was already uh, discussed by Mariano. But um, in terms of the looking at the hazards, the seismic hazard model, the um, the model proposed by um, CSSC was employed for this um, case study. Um, so I'm just going to show um, an, an example ground motion field that was uh, uh, applied to the selected case study area shown here. Um, so, so for this, um, this was um, positioned with the, the, the center point of the hazard area uh, located at, at a critical network element. Um, and this crit critical network element was identified using the between us the method um, that was described by um, Dina earlier. Um, the, the element along the network that would uh, result in um, effective division of the network. Um, and this was a, a, a bridge along the main Tenti motorway. Um, so we also looked at the earthquake uh, triggered landslides effects. And to do so, we adopted a rigid sliding block approach. Um, so shown here is um, th this what we did for this basically was to calculate the landslide yield acceleration values for the region. Um, and this, these values determine the horizontal acceleration at which sliding um, initiates. So in other words, a landslide occurs. Um, and to do so, we, we gathered um, data for the region, um, a digital elevation model to determine the slope values um, and geological information um, to, to determine this, va this value. Um, so under the, the defined system task, we also characterized the, the vulnerability of the network. Um, so we identified the, the bridges and tunnels along the road network. There was 340 bridges and 30 tunnels in total. And we also um, looked at the various uh, road types and we looked at road sections that were uh, located on slopes of greater than 10 degrees. Um, in terms of the vulnerability, we, we considered the the seismic vulnerability of bridges and tunnels, but we also considered the, the vulnerability of the individual road sections to earthquake-triggered landslides. So to characterize this network vulnerability um, in terms of the bridges and tunnels, um, we assigned fragility functions. Um, uh, this was already introduced by Dean earlier, but we, we gathered structural data for each of the network bridges and tunnels. Um, and we did this using Google Maps. Um, and of course, in, in many cases, if uh, an infrastructure manager is applying such an approach to their own, ne own network, they may have this information already available. Um, but based on the structural characteristics, we were then able to assign fragility functions um, to determine the, the probability of reaching exceeding specified damage states um, as a function of the um, intensity measure um, of the hazard, in this case, the peak ground acceleration. Um, and four damage states were defined um, for the bridges and, and tunnels, slight, moderate, extensive, and complete, as shown here. Um, additionally, we assigned for GOC functions to the road sections 
to characterize the vulnerability um, to earthquake triggered landslides. Um, so as you can see here, the, the fragility functions are also presented in, in terms of the peak ground acceleration. Um, and because we had determined the landslide yield, yield acceleration values for the region, we were able to, to draw a direct link between the, the earthquake hazard and the, the earthquake triggered landslide hazard. Um, and for this, three damage states were defined for each road section. Um, and these were assigned based on, on the, as I mentioned, the landslide yield acceleration value and also the road types, so the number of lanes. Um, so to, to characterize the, the network vulnerability or the, the consequences to the network, we also considered the functionality loss, um, as mentioned by Dina earlier as well. Um, we looked at functional capacity loss, um, functional capacity loss during restoration, restoration duration, and the repair costs. And these were related to the individual damage states. This enabled us to, to for a specific scenario, to, to determine the, um, the associated um, losses in terms of duration, cost, and, and capacity loss. Um, in terms of the consequences, then we, we conducted traffic um, modeling um, to determine the traffic delays for various scenarios. Um, so we performed two analyses. We performed, well, a variety of analyses, but uh, we performed them at two levels. We performed uh, a regional analysis to look at this, the selected case study area. Um, so what, what impact would um, the, the hazard scenarios have on the movement of traffic for the regional network? Um, and we did this using a next, next uh, traffic modeling software. Um, and for this, we, we obtained data on the, the, the daily movements of, of passengers within this region. So um, uh, shown here are the origin destination zones. So we obtained data that, that told us where people are traveling from and to which zone on a daily basis for, for work or, or travel or for work or study. So this is, gives us kind of a, a representative um, look at, at the movements of traffic along the network. Um, and then we were able to perform analyses um, uh, comparing the traffic movement and the, the duration of the travel um, times under normal operating conditions. Um, we were able to compare those two um, by simulating um, scenarios, post-hazard scenarios um, with, uh, network, uh, with damage along the network in terms of uh, bridges and tunnels and road sections. Um, and the associated impact in terms of the, the functionality loss. So in this case, we uh, define the speed reduction and the lane capacity reduction as a result of that damage. And we're able to, to then calculate the increase in travel time for users of the road network. Um, we also conducted this um, analysis at a uh, national scale. Um, so while we considered the, the, the direct impacts of the hazards for the selected case study region, um, we, we, we looked at the, the wider impacts for the national road network, um, also using next uh, traffic modeling software. And again, we obtained origin destination data for, um, for Italy um, from the previous uh, EU project, the ESSOS project, um, and that gave us a, a representative um, look at, at the demand for the, for the network. Um, so we conducted Monte Carlo sampling and to consider the epistemic uncertainties associated with the, the network, um, the vulnerability of the network elements. Um, and we uh, calculated the, the total network repair costs. So these are just a, a sample of the results. Um, and we were also able to, to, to um, determine, as I mentioned, the percentage increase in travel times at regional and national scales. Um, sorry, I'm just going to skip, skip through this because I know we're under time pressure. So just to, to summarize the results, I mean, um, I think it was very interesting to look at the, the comparison of, of, of national um, level to regional. Um, while while the, the impacts on the transport network at regional were not significant due to the density of the network, the, the impacts of this, the scenarios considered at national level were significant, um, which, which shows how you know, the, the spatial boundaries that Brian discussed earlier are very important in, in terms of, while you may be looking at the, the impacts of the hazard at a certain area, the wider impacts can be significant. 
Um, so this allowed us to, to, to estimate the losses. Um, and I should uh, emphasize that the, the risk ass assessment process was an iterative process, um, looking at the, um, the adequacy of the risk assessment. And this was done according to the, the procedure defined by ETH. Um, and then this allowed us to determine the, the outcomes of the stress test in terms of risk accessibility. Um, and while I've, I've talked about the, the risk assessment for uh, selected scenarios, we could also look at uh, future scenarios, so such as um, increasing the, the travel demand for the future or possible interventions along the network in terms of the fragility functions. Um, and we can see what, what impacts that has in terms of the, the overall losses. So I'll hand you over to Rob now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Corbley, and I'm also a research engineer with ROD. I, uh, I'm conscious that we're under a bit of time pressure, so I'll try to go through these slides as quickly as possible. So the second case study which we <coughs> used, used to demonstrate the infrarisk methodology was uh, based in Croatia, and we looked at uh, a portion of the 10T rail network in Croatia. So Julie just presented a case study which looked at seismic hazards, and here we considered uh, high consequence, low probability flood scenarios. So again, we looked at cascading landslide hazards. In this case, we looked at landslides which were likely to be induced by rainfall as opposed to earthquakes. And uh, we also looked at uh, flooding events and decided basically we'd look at bridge scour and inundation. And this was kind of based on our init initial qualitative assessment which we did. So we used GMA um, modeling and the objective ranking tool um, which proposed by Peter Prack to carry out an initial qualitative assessment. So basically when we were carrying out this analysis we had to look at uh, what parts of the network do we actually want to an analyze, which parts are mo most important, um, which parts are likely to be most at risk, and then kind of ranking these uh, various parts of the network, we could hone in on the different sections of the network, the different hazards that were likely to be most critical, and the different types of analysis that were likely to be most beneficial for us in carrying out our uh, stress test and our risk assessment. Um, then having carried out a qualitative inis initial assessment, we then went on and carried out a quantitative risk assessment um, in a similar fashion to that which was carried out in the first case study. Um, so as a kind of brief summary of the region, we looked at the section of the rail network shown in red in the map here. And this is a part of the network in northern Croatia. So the shaded section there is about 35,000 kilometers squared, and this is towards the north of Croatia. So at the northern boundary of the region there is the boundary between Croatia and Slovenia, and on the, I suppose, the northeastern side is where uh, the boundary with Hungary is. So we examined in total a, a region of approximately 800 kilometers of rail, and we kind of isolated the important parts of that uh, rail network and uh, focused on the infrastructure elements which were um, of most interest and for which we had the most data for and sufficient data to allow us to carry out appropriate analysis. Um, so I'm going to kind of present, first of all, how we model the hazards, and then I'll go through how we model the vulnerability or the resistance of our infrastructure elements to these ha hazards, and then how we carried out the actual analysis. Um, so for our flood hazard model, we kind of looked at three different things, and this was based on our qualitative assessment and combined the, the parts of the network that we thought were most of most interest and most at risk with the level of information and data that was available for, to us to allow us to carry out the assessment. So uh, after having done our qualitative assessment, we decided that um, we'd focus on bridge scour, uh, track inundation, and then track blockages due to rainfall-triggered landslides. So um, when modeling bridge scour, we looked at uh, one bridge in particular because, first of all, there were we had limited information on the bridges on the portion of the network that we wanted to look at. Um, we carried out visual inspections using Google Maps, and based on expert opinion, we kind of concluded that there was only really one bridge that we had sufficient data for that was actually susceptible to scour, and the other bridges um, either we didn't have enough data for, and in most cases they weren't susceptible to scour, so they were 
that it wasn't necessary to carry out analysis for these bridges. So this Koopa Karlovac bridge um, was uh, located along the line between Rijeka and Zagreb and was along, I suppose, the most important part of the network. So when uh, carrying out our flood hazard modeling, um, Peter Van Gelder mentioned this already, um, we were interested in looking at discharge levels in the river. So we had 25 years worth of data at a station in the Koopa River and we basically carried out a statistical analysis and we were then able to carry out um, an ex a probabilistic extrapolation using extreme value analysis to identify our 200 year, 500 year and 1000 year stress levels or our um, intensities or discharge levels. And then we had lower and upper bound values on these which allowed us to consider the uncertainty in the loading here. Um, then when considering our flood hazard for track inundation, we were interested in the water levels. So we wanted to work out what are the water levels relative to the levels of the track. So here we wanted to relate the discharge to the water levels. So we were able to define a relationship between the discharge and the water levels. And this is, as Peter Van Gelder showed earlier, this allowed us to develop um, discharge series. So for our different return periods, we were able to look at the discharge uh, at, uh, in, at the particular station and look at how that evolved over time uh, prior to and after the, uh, I suppose, intense flood event. Um, then finally, in order to allow us to calculate water levels to assess track inundation, uh, a linear hydrodynamic modeling approach was applied. And this, as Peter Van Gelder discussed earlier, allowed us to analyze the propagation of the flood wave downstream and to calculate the water levels at the various sections of interest uh, when assessing the inundation of the track. Finally then, when looking at our hazard modeling for rainfall triggered landslides, we were interested in looking at rainfall intensities or duration of rainfall. So we had daily rainfall data and um, we carried out basically a statistical analysis again to look at different intensities and then extrapolate to look at the 200, 500 and 1000 year uh, rainfall durations, which then allowed us to calculate the likelihood of uh, rainfall induced landslides. Um, now we'll move on to how we looked at the vulnerability or the resistance of the structures to these loadings due to flooding. Um, so first of all, looking at the Karlovac Bridge, uh, we were interested in Scour. So we carried out uh, some detailed modeling of the bridge and we carried out Scour modeling for a range of discharge levels. And we were basically able to relate these discharge levels and the resulting scour to uh, losses in structural capacity and then therefore losses in functional capacity of the network. So for various levels of uh, damage. So we defined three damage states um, and these damage states were related to functional losses on the network. So for, for limited damage, you might have to limit the train speed uh, and carry out repairs. Um, you may have to, for the next damage that you may need to disrupt traffic while the, completely while the bridge has been repaired and then you have a damage state of total collapse where the network, that portion of the network is closed until the bridge is fully repaired. So we had different damage states and fragility curves developed for both the piers and the abutments of the bridge and these were then used to compare for our different loading scenarios uh, the probability of experiencing different damage. Um, we, I'll also mention that we considered scarer protection measures. So we had no information on the actual scarer protection that was in place for the bridge. So we um, made an assumption that the scarer protection had been designed to, um, to resist uh, a one in 500 year event and we adjusted the fragility curves appropriately so that scour wouldn't occur until the, this flow value had been exceeded. Um, similarly, for track inundation, we defined a number of damage states. So um, we defined a slight, moderate, or extensive damage state for track inundation, and all of these had associated um, repair times, repair costs, and functional losses for the network. Uh, we then defined fragility curves in terms of track inund or in terms of water level, um, which allowed us to calculate the probability of uh, dip being in different damage states given various water levels. So we had fragility curves uh, which were developed for rails which were on grade or in cut and we also had rails on embankments with various fragility curves for the different parts of the network we were looking at. Um, finally then we had 
uh, fragility curves, uh, which represented the likelihood of experiencing rainfall-induced landslides. So again, we had three different damage states, and we, in a similar fashion, developed fragility curves, which uh, gave us probabilities of failure for various rainfall durations. Um, so as a quick summary of the network we were looking at, and based on our qualitative assessment of the parts of the network which were most at risk, we had uh, parts of the network which we deemed to be susceptible to inundations. So the bits shown in yellow here were divided up into various segments. Um, then the Karlovac Bridge was kind of at the center of the network here, and then the slopes deemed to be susceptible to rainfall-induced landslides were in the northeastern region, more mountainous region. So we then carried out, in a similar fashion to the first case study, a Monte Carlo sampling method, which allowed us to consider the uncertainty in both the loading and the vulnerability of the structures. So we looked at direct consequences again in terms of uh, total network repair cost, and this graph here basically shows, um, considering scare and inundation, um, how likely we were to experience different levels of cost to repair the network. And you can see the outputs there are shown for a 200, 500 year and 1000 year scenario. And they're, they're not too dissimilar because based on the actual loading intensities and the measured data which we had, the values weren't too different when considering extrapolations to different uh, return periods. Um, you can see the results are kind of stepped as well. And the reason for this is that the, for two, two main reasons, the bridge was shown to be the driving factor in the results. So, the bridge failure was more likely to occur than mass inundation across the whole network. And in addition, the cost of repairing the bridge, severe damage to the bridge, was um, much more uh, than if minor damage was occurring due to inundation. So you can kind of see for various um, damage states, we have various associated costs, and that's the reason that the, there's a kind of a step nature in the results here. And we had a similar output then for the northeastern part of the region where we were looking at the effect of uh, rainfall-induced landslides. And again, we have probabilities of exceedance for uh, of various costs. And here we can see there's actually, I say, a 60% probability for all of the re return periods of experiencing some damage or some cost to repair the network. Where therefore, there's also a 40% chance, given our inputs, that there's no damage at all and that there will, won't be any landslides. And then, of course, with uh, increasing costs, you have lower probability of occurrence. Um, then we, uh, we looked at indirect consequences. Um, I suppose the indirect consequences in terms of repair times, um, freight uh, disruption on the network, and passenger train disruption. So again, we have kind of similar step responses for inundation and scour, and then rainfall-induced landslides. Um, and then looking at the level of affected freight, in tons on the network. We have a, a kind of a, a similar response there and the number of affected passenger trains in the region. So I suppose in conclusion, these, these results similar to those shown in the first case study um, are, I suppose the accuracy of the results are dependent on the level of information available to us. And in some cases we had limited information, so we had to make some assumptions. Um, and, there, and we also had to limit the, I suppose, the amount of the network which we were carrying out our analysis for. So the more information that's available, and I think this was kind of, Dina mentioned this earlier, the better. So um, any information that can be used in this increases the accuracy of the results and any stakeholders or people who are involved in this sort of work, um, their input's invaluable. So this type of analysis can become more accurate and can really give you an insight to the risk associated with, the, uh, with natural hazards to your network. Um, and overall, then looking at these results um, can allow an infrastructure manager to decide whether or not they're uh, willing to accept these risks and whether or not they would like to implement various mitigation strategies and look at the corresponding reduction in risk and whether they're willing to spend money and it's worth doing it or not. Um, and for further information, the more detail on the analysis and the results are published in the final deliverable uh, the case study results. And that's it. Thank you.